so this is the correct version. So here we've talked about sensory information comes in, all right, to the primary sensory area. So that's where it's received and processed. And then to be able to interpret that or identify it, then the association area is going to receive that information, all right? For the motor portion, that starts off in the motor association area where putting together the plan happens and then it's sent to the primary motor area where that plan is sent out. So here it's kind of bookended a bit if you see something, right? And so if we think about taking a quarter out of a pocket, of a pocket full of coins in which back in the day when something cost a quarter and they a uh, vending machine, let's say, you know, you were able to figure out, okay, if I want to stick my hand in my pocket, right, that plan starts off in the motor association area, and then the physical actual, you know, that plan being sent out to be able to coordinate that is being done, uh, being sent out from the primary motor association area. And then you start uh, receiving signals, right, for feeling the coins in your pocket, trying to identify which one might be a quarter. So here that sensory information is coming into the primary sensory area. Be able to identify, so interpret those signals is happening in the sensory association area. You're able to find a quarter. Once again, be able to pull that quarter out starting here in the motor association area, right, for that plan, and then the actual plan being sent out to execute that is going to be from the primary motor area. Everybody following me on this? So here it kind of uh, bounces between primary and association areas. Okay. And with respect to sensory, it starts off in the primary, and then you have identification interpreting going on in the association, and then that's kind of flipped over when we talk about motor, right? The planning part starts in the associ prime, uh, motor association area, then the plan is sent out right, in the primary motor area. All right. Okay. Okay, so here's, uh, you know, some of the structures. Remember, uh, we have our lobes. So hopefully you're getting comfortable with where the lobes are and the uh, demarcations, what separates one lobe from the next. So we have our frontal lobe, our parietal lobe, our occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and then if we look, separate this lateral sulcus, we can see in here, and that's our insula, that's our last lobe. And remember, we're only looking at one hemisphere, so remember we have a right and a left temporal lobe, right and left parietal lobe, and so forth. Okay, so there's lateralization that goes on. One of the major structures we talk about is the central sulcus. So sulcus is what? Anybody remember? What's that? It's a sulcus. Yeah, it's a depression, right? So it's kind of the valley. And then on each side of the central sulcus, we have two gyri or a singular gyrus. So what's a gyrus? Yeah, so it's a peak. Yeah, exactly. So not surprising you're going to have, you know, a gyrus in between two sulci, or you can think about two sulci sandwiching a gyrus here. So we have a pre-central gyrus and a post-central gyrus. Parietal is going to be involved with sensory information. Frontal part is going to be involved with motor. So here we generally have the primary and the association, uh, corresponding association areas and close anatomical, uh, closely anatomically situated. And so here is where we have our motor, motor association area. Here's where we have our primary motor cortex. Here's where we have our sensory association area. So sensory, somatic sensory, we're talking about a lot of cutaneous sensation, feeling things. Um, all right, and so also what's happening, uh, that's those signals from senses, the sensory information is coming into this primary sensory cortex and then sent over to the 
sensory association area for identification and interpretation. The other thing that this uh, sensory association area does is that if you look at something, you kind of have an idea of maybe what the texture might feel like. So if you take a look at sandpaper, you're going to feel or you're going to sense or anticipate that it's going to be rough. Glass, you're going to anticipate it's going to be smooth. Okay, so that's another thing that the motor association, er or not motor, but the sensory association area does, is this kind of anticipation of what that feeling is going to be like, the texture. All right, so we're going to dig into each one of these. Um, so we, I know we covered a little bit of this already, but here, the primary cortex, so if it's primary, not an association area, what's it doing? You might remember it. When we're talking about sensory, primary sense. It's receiving the signal, right? It's receiving and basically processing that signal. It's going to be sent it out. And notice here what we're looking at is the post central gyrus. Okay? So here we're cutting along the post central gyrus. So if I go back a slide to point this out, right? So we're kind of cutting right along here. Or sorry, uh, yeah, so the primary, right along here. So the post-central gyrus is where we have our primary sensory uh, area. Okay? And each one of these uh, structures is mapped, and the size is indicating how much sensory information is coming in from those different regions. For instance, you can see our face is, and our tongue has quite a bit of sensory information. Uh, hip, not so much. Okay? Right? And so this thing is a homunculus, so mapping basically the I, you know, what this looks like uh, with respect to the degree or how much sensory information is coming in. Right. So remember, this is happening in which lobe? It's in the postcentral gyrus, which is part of which lobe? parietal lobe, right? And remember here we have a right and a left. So if we're talking about, say, getting sensations from our left fingers, right? our left fingers, then the contralateral part of the primary somatosensory cortex is going to be registering that. So when I say contralateral, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Opposite side, right? What's the term for the same side? Ipsilateral, right? Okay, so ipsilateral, so contralateral and then ipsilateral. So here the sensory information decusates or crosses over to the other side for being interpreted. Motor association or motor is also going to decusate so that the contralateral side is involved. Right? So here, sensory, somatosensory association areas, you know, we can talk about the somatosensory association area. That's going to be a lot of the uh, cutaneous sensations, uh, visual association area, interpreting what you guys see, auditory interpreting sound, which we'll talk about. Right? Uh, we also have the uh, somatic motor association area. That's where the planning is happening that we talked about for actual skilled skeletal muscle movement. And then also language. So being able to interpret, identify language. And then this last one was the very anterior part of the frontal lobe, which was involved with a lot of executive function, judgment, intellect, and so forth. All right. So Somatic uh, sensory is in the parietal lobe, right? And so if you're digging, you know, without looking into your purse, book bag, or your pocket, you know, trying to find something, a certain coin, for instance, you're going to be using this area of your brain, right? Okay. So what about the motor association area? Well, like we said at the very beginning, this association area is involved with putting together the plan, or at least initiating putting together the plan, okay, to be able to execute something. 
a skilled skeletal muscle movement, right? And so here, this is starting here in this area of the frontal lobe. And even just to walk upstairs, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think about it, but it's a really complicated process. You have to know where your legs are in relation to the stairs. You have to know how high to bring your leg to clear that stair. So there's going to be a lot of sensory input coming in. How much muscle or which muscle and which muscles to fire, right? On one leg and which muscles and uh, how many or the types and how to what degree are you going to be firing muscles on your opposite leg? Right? So there's a lot of things that go on with starting to put together this plan. Some is going to some of this plan is going to integrate information from other parts of the brain too, as it's sent out. But the initiation to be able to start off with the idea that I want to walk up these stairs and starting the uh, planning process happens here in the motor association area. Now, yeah. On the last slide, you had uh, some motor memories that are stored here. Mm -hmm. Is that like walking upstairs? Some, some are. Some are stored in other areas of our brain, like the cerebellum. You know, so, um, and then also think about back to the patellar tendon reflex, right? So some reflexes, you know, are kind of. If you think about computer programs, there's kind of um, subroutines in the computer programs that are just used automatically, you know, that are integrated into that larger computer program. That's kind of what you, how I think about reflexes. You know, those are kind of also um, hardwired into this, right? Um, and so it's not all uh, memories of skilled motor movement are housed here. Some of them are housed in other parts of the brain. And eventually, they'll funnel into this um, plan that gets sent out. But the very start of making this plan up to be able to do this task starts here in the motor association. Yep. Any other questions? All right, so we've got a plan. All right, so taking a coin out of our pocket to be able to put in the vending machine. All right, and so here we have our, uh, you know, want to put the coin in the coin slot. So we have that initiation of that plan to do that, right? And part of that is to have all the skilled motor movement to be able to do that. That plan gets sent out via the motor, primary motor cortex. And remember, this is the precentral gyrus. Right, so here's our central sulcus. Here, here's our precentral gyrus, and this is all part of the frontal lobe. All right, to be able to execute that, and there's other places of our brain that's going to send in information to help integrate to be able to do this. Okay, so precise skeletal movements. Now, the other uh, part that we have that's involved with skilled skeletal movements is the movement of uh, our vocal or muscles involved with the vocal apparatus. So being able to, uh, you know, properly, you know, say words, speech. So here, we're not talking about, say, uh, generating speech. We're saying executing that speech, you know, a uh, program. Okay, it's being sent out from this primary motor area. And this is also locate, located in the frontal lobe. It doesn't have the word primary in it. So here, this area is Broca's, where we're going to get a lot of speech planning gets sent out. So it tells the facial muscles how to, you know, uh, coordinate so that they can actually do the speaking. All right. So if someone has a problem, in Broca's area, what's that going to look like? What's that going to look like? So you could have a stroke in this area. So what's that going to look like? Well, we're talking about language. OK, right, so we're going to have problems with actual physical movement of the speech muscles, right? 
Now, is this person going to be able to understand what you're telling them? Are they going to be able to write answers coherently? Yes, absolutely, right? So their ability to actually take in information from language, speech, is not impaired. Their ability to respond via their vocal apparatus is affected. So individuals that have, say, a stroke in this area, that's what it's going to look like, right? Okay, a lesion, so, you know, head trauma, okay, in this specific area of uh, the frontal lobe. So Broca's aphasia, it's called. Okay. All right, so we covered that. So just as a reminder, so what we took a look at, so we had our somatic motor association area that is going to initiate the planning, then it's going to send it to this primary motor cortex to send out that plan. And Part of that is going to integrate information from other parts of the brain. So not surprisingly, just like when we saw, we, we, when we looked at with the sensory, the postcentral gyrus, where we had the homunculus, where size of the different body parts represent how much um, you know, neural innovation is in that part, how much sensory information is in that part. All right, uh, same thing for the motor, right? So you can see here that, all right, to move, uh, you know, a lot of the sensory somatic sense or somatic motor neurons that are innervating, say, the knee, not so much, but look at all the part of this structure, this area that's dedicated to moving parts of our face, right? So. Here, you know, this is representing, this homunculus is representing how much nervous innovation is going into moving different parts of our body. It's reflected on the size of that uh, area here. So remember, precentral gyrus, right, is part of what lobe? Frontal lobe, right? Postcentral gyrus is part of which lobe? Parietal lobe. In both cases, we have lateralization. We have a right and a left. So here, if we're going to be trying to move, say, our right thumb, okay, which hemisphere is going to be initiating that movement? Left hemisphere, the contralateral, okay, contralateral. All right, so we also kind of mentioned Broca's area, right? It's part of being able to send out that actual ability to speak. It's not impairing anyone's ability to understand language. So not surprisingly, you'll find that for language, there is an area that's involved with integrating and identifying, you know, language. All right, so let me see if I can get this to work. Sign waves twice again. The 
So it was just random sine waves that were put together to make that audio recording. So it's like someone randomly hitting keys on a keyboard that happened to come out in something that you thought was intelligent, you know, or uh, a sentence that made sense, right? So what part of our brains involved with this? Well, certainly sensory uh, sensory information is coming in through our ears. But to understand what's going on, that speech, all right, language, that has to happen in the area that's going to identify and interpret it, right? So not surprisingly, there's a language association area, and that language association area is called Wernicke's area. Okay? And so that's, it, if you're uh, routing part of your brain thinks, oh, what we're hearing is speech. Let's identify, interpret it. It's being routed to this Wernicke's area. Okay. And so that's what was happening when you guys were identifying this random sine waves as being some sort of speech pattern. You know, words. Uh, so here, after the uh, you know uh, you know fellow told you what it said, you had now a memory, right? That you accessed, and so it made it sound like it was even closer to speech, right? It got routed, right? You weren't doing as much figuring out where to route it. Your brain wasn't. It was automatically thinking, oh, yeah. That speech, it should go here for identification interpretation, right? And so that's what's going on, right? So here, the auditory association area, okay, that's where the sounds coming in is figuring out, hey, is, are these words or is this just noise? Is this music? Okay, right? So maybe if you didn't hear the random sine waves as words initially. Maybe it just got sent to an area that said, this isn't speech, this is noise, right? The Wernicke's area is going to be taking things that are considered speech and then going to be trying to understand what it's saying, all right? So this is part of the parietal and temporal lobes. So here, if someone has a lesion or a stroke or has some sort of problem in Wernicke's area, what's that going to look like in that individual? Right, exactly. Are they going to have problems with the actual mouthing speech? No. So, you know, I've worked on a certain type of dementia that has three variants. One of the variants is called semantic dementia. It means that these individuals have difficulty association, associating, associating um, say, a uh, object with words. So if you give them a picture of a child flying a kite, okay, their speech is fairly fluent. But they wouldn't say, oh, that's a child flying a kite. Uh, they'll say, oh, this little thing is doing this with that. And so they generally have problems with coming up with understanding or uh, accessing that type of memory information, right? Now, they're completely fluent, but it may come out somewhat more like gibberish in some cases that are more severe. And just to round out the whole dementia conversation, there are certain types of dementia that affect the area that is uh, around Bro Broca's area, right? Those individuals, they understand language perfectly fine, bless you, but what ends up happening is that they progressively lose the ability to speak. Okay, so it's called progressive non-fluent 
and aphasia. So progressive because it gets worse with time, non-fluent meaning that they're losing that ability to speak. All right, so we'll talk about what happens if that, what it looks like if this is damaged. But remember, we also have these general interpretation areas. So here we have in the occipital lobe, a primary visual cortex and an association area. Then here's our auditory cortex and auditory association area where sensory information is coming in, gets processed, sent to a place that identify, interprets it, and then sends it further to areas that are appropriate. For instance, if it's identified as maybe a speech pattern, then it's going to be going to Wernicke's area for further kind of decrypting, if you will. All right. Is it making sense between the primary and the association areas? You guys have any questions up to this point? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's a great connection. So here, the cranial nerves, a lot of them are coming from special, uh, specialized sensory organs, right? Like the ears, for instance. And we're going to talk about special senses after the first exam, you know. And certainly, it's the uh, sensory information is going to these areas, but um, there's, it branches off to other parts of the brain as well. For instance, you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, visual input, we have to interpret visual things, but we're also getting information that is important for regulating sleep-wake cycle, circadian rhythm, and that's being routed to other parts of the brain as well. Okay, so yes, absolutely, sensory information from our special senses is being routed to these areas. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a great question. All right, so this is just pointing out, not surprisingly, these primary and association areas usually anatomically closely associated. I think one of the um, ones that isn't is the one with language. So broke is a little bit more with the actual physical speech, moving the muscle, mouth muscles, facial muscles to um, mouth, actual words, and Wernicke's which is a little bit further away is involved with the kind of more the association area tasks of interpreting, identifying uh, language. Okay, so here visual association areas on the occipital lobe, like I said, it's going to be interpreting visual input, so the primary visual areas receiving that and processing it and then sending it off to the visual association area for your actual figuring out, oh, is that a phone? What type of phone is it? And so forth. All right. Uh, when we get to special senses, I'll post something on blind sight, you know, where individuals have a problem with this area, but that visual information gets routed to other, has also other parts of the brain that visual information is going to that allows someone to figure out whether something's moving up, down, side to side, but they can't tell you what it is which seems kind of counterintuitive, right? All right, so here, also we can have emotional influence on a lot of this sensory information. So here, uh, you know, if you take a look at something and you realize that, oh, that, uh, you know, donut from Krispy Kreme, I have a fond memory of it, right? Okay, then that memory, when you see it again, all right, is going to be triggered. So emotional influence, right? Now, if you didn't like that Krispy Kreme donut, which I don't know anyone who would say that, but if you had a negative memory, emotional association, then you would see it and go ick, right? And you wouldn't want to deal with it. So if you take a look at this, right, what does this cloud look like? Rabbit, okay. Now, you guys say that because you probably have seen a rabbit, right? So if someone hadn't seen a rabbit, right, they didn't have that memory, this would just pretty much look like a cloud, right? Yeah. So here, you know, memories influence what's going on. Anybody see any movement in here? Yeah, so it's a bit of a tricky. So here, your eyes 
you know, you would think, you know, this is being tricked to figure out, okay, you know, that looks like at one second there was some movement, but then, and then there's really, it looks static. So it's kind of figure, your brain's trying to figure out what's going on with this, right? So once again, you know, this is, you know, using that visual association area. And so what are people seeing here? So face, so maybe two faces, yeah. candlestick, right? Yeah, so you guys are using some past memories to be able to interpret this. But once again, are we looking at, you know, uh, the white or the black, right, to be able to figure out what it is? And then here, if you look at this from far away, what does this look like? Okay, skull. So here, looking at it far away, it looks like one thing. And then when you look up close to it, what are you seeing? Yeah, so basically, you know, uh, two individuals, right? Okay. So here, you know, the visual information is trying to access, or the uh, part of your brain is being acts is trying to access memories to figure out what does this look like from what you've seen before. All right, so like we talked about the prefrontal cortex, decision making, judgment, intellect, a lot of these what we call executive functions are happening here. And so this is kind of the last association area that we're talking about, um, you know, that's part of the cerebral cortex. So it turns out that personality and behavior are also part of this area. So if someone has this part of their brain affected, damaged, what does this look like? Yeah, exactly. You know, so there's a certain variant of this frontal temporal dementia called the behavioral variant, which affects this part of the brain. And these individuals undergo personality and behavior changes, which is really impactful because a lot of times the caregivers for these individuals that have neurodegenerative disease are family members, family members that have lived with them for decades, who know these people, they know their personality and behavior, and then all of a sudden they're changing that personality and behavior. So it's emotionally very difficult. And so a lot of times people that are, uh, you know, uh, saying, uh, are very sensitive and appropriate in conversation to become the opposite. They say, you know, inappropriate things at inappropriate times. Are they going to have problems with planning? So keeping appointments? Absolutely. Right? So that's kind of a real big problem also because finances, you have to make a lot of good decisions. Right? And so here we know that with healthcare, it costs quite a bit in the end of life, which is a primary, uh, a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases affect individuals later in life who have impairment in judgment, right? So it's really problematic. So how many folks have heard of someone named Phineas Gage? So some folks, so he was a you know, railroad, railroad worker in the 1800s. He was tamping down some explosives with an iron rod, and he ignited the explosives, and the iron rod went through his head. And it went through this part of his brain, which meant that, you know, it caused a massive trauma to this part of the brain, and it affected his behavior and personality. So beforehand, he was very, uh, you know, a uh, uh, very affable person, I uh, very much, you know, uh, was easy to get along with um, and also was fairly decent at planning. After this injury, though, all of those things changed. And so one of the quotes from folks was that he was uh, prone to grossest fits of profanity uh, after this. And so, you know, the behavior and personality changes occurred because this part of the brain was affected.
Okay, so just taking a look at these, so we have the primary and association areas, and so these are some of the major ones. And so generally we have the corresponding primary and association area. Remember for, for language or speech here, you know, they don't have the word primary and association, unfortunately, in their name. The last thing I'll mention here, uh, and then we'll take a break, is Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia of people over the age of 65. And it is going to be affecting the cerebrum primarily. And so when you guys see mild versus severe Alzheimer's disease, what does the difference in the brain look like to you guys? What, do you, what differences are you seeing? More spread out, you see a little bit more spaces in the severe than you do the mild. Anybody see anything else? I think that's the big one though, right? And so you're kind of losing some mass. So if you take a look at, you know, this area, okay, it's quite a bit larger, right? Starting to see shrinking of that cortical areas, which means that we're affecting a lot of neuronal function of the cerebrum. And so here, there's still a lot of research being done on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you know, the exact molecular mechanisms uh, that are contributing and to what degree they contribute to uh, the pathology or the uh, disease itself. It's not completely clear. What we do know is that there's this decreased acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter used in the brain, and that there are neurons that die um, it's generally uh, considered because of toxicity from certain proteins that build up, all right, that are known as plaques, um, and they interfere with neuronal function to the point where the neurons can no longer function properly and therefore can die, and so you're disrupting the networks that should be able to carry out the normal function. Right. And so here we're losing a lot of those higher order cerebral functions that we talked about. Being able to identify, interpret sensory information, execute a skilled skeletal muscle, you know, movement, and, you know, in some cases also affecting personality and behavior uh, when we affect the prefrontal cortex. Right? Um, so here all of these things are going to be affected that we've talked about with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't we take a five minute break and then we're going to switch to taking a look at the white matter of the cerebrum. So up to this point we've talked about really cortical structures, right, which is going to be the exterior part of the cerebrum and remember those cortical structures are more gray matter, right? We're going to talk about the white matter structures next. All right, so why don't we take a break and then we'll talk about these guys after the break. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and continue our conversation. All right, so up to this point, we've talked about gray structures of the cerebrum, okay? So. So we've talked about gray structures of the cerebrum, which is the outer portion. So if we're talking about gray structures, what are we looking at here? Non-myelinated structures, right? So here, the white matter structures are going to have what? What's that? Myelin, right? So myelinated structures, which are going to be mostly axons. Anybody remember what myelin mostly is made up of? So it's a cell membrane wrapped around axons, right? So what's made up, what's making up most of the cell membrane? What's, what's that? It's swan cells, but part of the swan cell that is wrapping around is a lot of the cell membrane. What makes up the cell membrane? Phospholipids. 
So is that going to be, is if you look at white matter versus gray matter, which one is going to be more fatty? White matter, right? Because it has those lipids. Okay. So it's one of the reasons that the brain is kind of considered fatty tissue is because of all the myelination. All right, so here, the white matter here for the cerebrum is going to be interior. So part of it's located here, and it stretches to other to the other side of this hemisphere. All right. Other parts of the white matter are going to be located in this area here. Okay. All right. And so here, if I take out, you know, the diencephalon, the brainstem, the cerebellum, you can kind of see a lot of this white matter. It's an important structure that connects one hemisphere to the other. So you can see that on both of these hemispheres. That structure is called the corpus callosum. It allows one hemisphere to communicate with the other hemisphere. Right? And so you can see that if we take a look at a frontal or a coronal section here. And so that's what this is. Right? So there is an important structure, white matter structure, called the corpus callosum. It allows communication between the hemispheres. And so here, what are these areas here? Those are the ventricles. What's inside of them? CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Right? So we got our two lateral ventricles that are going to empty through aperture to make the third ventricle, then that goes through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle here. That's located in the posterior part of the brain stem. What's this structure here? It is a cerebellum, right? So it's this kind of back part of the brain that we'll talk about in the very last. Right, cerebellum literally translated as small, small cerebrum. That's what it translates to. Okay, so here, these are going to be myelinated. They have axons primarily, which means that they're kind of highways to be able to connect different parts of the cerebrum to different to other parts of the cerebrum as well as other brain structures. Right, so we have integration of information. So corpus callosum is one major one. The other ones are locations of some of this white matter deep. Okay, right. So here the white matter is going to be important for connecting different parts of our brain to lower brain centers. So not surprisingly, if we have sensory information coming up, in some cases it's going to go to some white matter structures and then sent out two gray matter structures, a lot of which we talked about, cerebral gray matter structures, so those primary and association areas. Okay? Some of the deep gray matter structures okay, are called nuclei here in the brain. So not nucleus of a cell or nucleus of an atom, but nuclei with respect to nervous tissue. So here they're gray matter, which means that they are um, going to be groups of myelinated part of the neuron or not. Not myelinated part of the neuron. So here's where we have actual connections going on, right? Where we have synapses, where we have a relay from going from one neuron to the next, where we have synaptic transmission going on. It is happening a lot in this gray matter that's in the deep part of the brain. You don't have to know all of these nuclei. There's a whole bunch of them that people are very interested in for a variety of reasons. But here, this is, if we have synapsing going on, this is where information's coming in and being integrated in, or information's coming out and being sent to different places. Okay, so here this is helping with fine-tune that, say, motor plan as it gets sent out to our skeletal muscles, right? So here there's going to be basal nuclei 
that's even deeper. Okay, and so here, this is where we have a little bit more pre-programmed types of things going on. So rigidity and stiffness. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, you're going to see more activity. We also have some neurons that are going to be uh, releasing dopamine into this area or their dopaminergic neurons um, to fine tune that motor movement. And so those neurons start in a different area that's located in the brainstem. And so they do what we call project, which means that they start here and then they go and they end their synapse, their axon terminus, and someplace else. Okay, so they start, you know, in the brainstem area and they project into this area to be able to fine tune this movement. So it helps smooth movements. Okay, all right. So now we're going to talk about going deeper. So if we take a look at our brain here, okay, so we're going to take a look at a structure that's called the diencephalon. One of the major structures of the diencephalon is this guy, okay? You can see here and how it fits in. If I can get it in there. There we go. It fits fairly deep in there, okay? Right? And we have one on each side. That structure is called the thalamus, right? The thalamus, okay? So here's the thalamus, and then located just below it, standing in this area, is something called the hypothalamus. Okay, the hypothalamus. All right. Those are the two major structures of the diencephalon that we're going to talk about. And because the pituitary gland and the pineal gland are kind of related structures or anatomically associated. We're going to talk about those as well, even though they're not necessarily considered part of the diencephalon. So here's our thalamus up here, okay, extends to this area where we have our hypothalamus, okay. That is going to project down into this little area, which is called the pituitary gland. Okay. So hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. On the posterior part is where we have the pineal gland. Right? The pineal gland. When we get into the endocrine section, we're going to talk a lot more about the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. We're just going to briefly mention them in this section. Yeah, I'm going to do that. So here, okay, so here's going to be part of our uh, thalamus, and here's our hypothalamus, and then this is our pituitary gland here. In the posterior, we have our pineal gland. Yeah, it's going to be in this area here. And you're, we'll, when we get to endocrine section, we'll see that there's neurons as well as other cells that project down into the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus and pituitary gland communicate uh, largely with each other. When we get to endocrine section, we'll see that. What do these structures do? The take home for the thalamus is that it is a routing center where it is going to be processing information and relaying it out, okay? So here, if you remember, when we were talking about tracts of the spinal cord, one of those tracts was a spinal thalamic tract, right? So that means is that sending sensory information or motor information? It's sensory information, it's gonna be afferent, it's going to be an ascending tract, right? Because you know that spino refers to the where it starts, and thalamic, now you know, is part of the brain, it's where it ends. So if it starts in the spinal cord, it ends here, it means that it's going this direction, which 
means that it's sensory information. Once that information comes up to the thalamus, there are synapses here that are going to route that information to the appropriate areas of the brain. So for instance, if sensory information is coming up the spinal thalamic tract that is, say, maybe coming from your fingers, when you're reaching into your pocket full of coins to find a quarter for the vending machine, right? That's going to be routed where? So to the primary somatosensory cortex, which is going to process that and then send it off to the sensory association area for identifying and interpreting, right? So it's a bit of a relay station, a routing center here, okay, for a lot of sensory information. So it's going to be routing things coming from lower brain centers, as well as in some cases spinal cord, like we saw. Okay. It's also involved with filtering things, uh, so making sure that things that aren't supposed to go, uh, you know, to a certain area don't go to that area. All right. But the bottom line, the take home here is it is a major relay area between the cortical structures that we talked about and the lower brain and the spinal cord structures. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Well, where are we starting? Okay. So, so you, you got, where's your start with the receptors? So they're in your fingers, right? Okay. And so that's sensory information. What's the first? So what's the first part of the CNS that's going to go to? What's that? So certainly mechanoreceptors, but what part of the CNS is that mechanoreceptor uh, signal going to? So what part? So the CNS. So you got two options: brain and spinal cord. Go to the spinal cord first, right? And so here, if you're tracking this, if you're writing it out, right, sensory information is going along into the spinal cord. So it's going along the dorsal root into the dorsal horn. And then if it's going to be going up to the thalamus, it's going to go along what tract? What tract? The spinal thalamic tract. Yep. Right? And then in the once it reaches the thalamus, right, we have a synapse that's going to send that information from the thalamus to what's the area that receives that information in the cerebral cortex? It receives it and processes it. Is that a primary or an association area? Let's start there. Primary, right? So that would be the primary somatosensory cortex, right? That's going to process it and send it off to the area that does the identifying and interpreting, which is what? Association area, right? Okay. So here what ends up happening is it gets routed along your peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, and then from the spinal cord up to your brain via a tract, in this case a spinal thalamic. There's other tracts, some of which not all are going to relay through the thalamus. And then the sensory information is always received in the primary area. And then the identifying and interpreting is always done in an association area for sensory information. So think of association areas, you should think about identifying and interpreting. So figuring out whether that coin that you're, uh, you know, uh, have in your pocket is a quarter, for instance. Does that help there, Sean? It does. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, fantastic. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So the other structure, and we'll talk more about this in when we talk about the endocrine system and also the autonomic nervous system is the hypothalamus, which controls a lot of body functions involved with homeostasis, such as, say, regulating body temperature, all right? Also, 
electrolyte levels, fluid, uh, blood fluid levels, for instance, water balance. Okay. Uh, all right. So a lot of thermal regulation and water balance are happening here in the hypothalamus. We're not going to go into all the other things it does because we're going to talk about those when we get to autonomic nervous system, especially in the endocrine system. Pituitary gland, a lot of times it's considered the master gland. You guys will talk a lot more about this. Hypothalamus and pituitary in the endocrine section. Uh, remember here it's involved with releasing a lot of hormones that influence a lot of other glands that release hormones, so it's a lot of times considered the master gland that is controlling a lot of the release of hormones and a lot of um, impact other structures. And that's basically the take home for now for looking at the pituitary gland. We'll talk it, about it in more detail when we get into the endocrine section. All right. The pineal gland is involved with generating melatonin, right? So this accumulates during the day that makes us sleepy and helps us go to, uh, you know, go to have a proper sleep-wake cycle. It's not the only area of the brain, though, involved with the circadian rhythm. So it's only one of the areas, okay? Um, and so that's as about as deep as we're going to talk about the pineal gland. And so remember here, that's located here in the posterior part. The pituitary gland was this structure down here. The hypothalamus was this area in here. Okay. All right. And so figuring out the sleep-wake cycle circadian rhythm took a lot of years of work. And so they, uh, several, uh, you know, scientists won the Nobel Prize for that, uh, you know, back in two, you know, fairly recently, okay? So here, if we're looking at the diencephalon, the pituitary, and the pineal gland, so here we're taking a look at the diencephalon, which is largely the thalamus, which is going to be in here, and then we'll have our hypothalamus down here, our pituitary in this area, and our pineal gland here in the back, okay? I think it's really difficult to see these structures because if you remember that animation of how the brain gets formed in neonates, it kind of folds back on itself. And so these are the interior structures that got folded back on. And so here, I think it's a little bit easier on the brains, you know, the model where you can see this is the thalamus and notice that we're going to have one on one side for one hemisphere and one on the other side for the other hemisphere. And here is going to be our hypothalamus down here. And then you can always figure where the pituitary gland because the hypothalamus kind of points to it, right? The pineal gland is going to be located in the back here, okay? Okay, so last bit we're going to look at uh, or sorry, a limbic system. The take home here is that the limbic system is involved with associating emotion to something. So emotional memory. Right. The other major take home for the limbic system is that struck parts of the uh, structures involved are uh, part of the limbic system that are part of the limbic system are also involved in learning and memory. Okay, So here, links to emotions and memory are part of the limbic system. The interior structure there of the limbic system is quite complex. So here, they kind of color coded a little bit on this brain. I can put the cephalon back in here. There we go. So here, the limbic system, a lot of the limbic system is colored orange here. So you can see that it's got part of the cerebrum and then part of these interior structures, okay? So some of those are called, uh, some of those interior structures, their names are the amygdala and hippocampus, and we just talked a little bit about the hypothalamus, right? Okay, and so here, this is basically the take home is learning memory and emotional memory, right? So here, you know, thinking about 
if something gives you a very visceral response. So if there's a smell, that as soon as you smell it, you feel nauseous, you're activating the limbic system. Okay. So sometimes this is called kind of the primordial part of our brain that gives us reflexes. You see something rustling in the bushes, right? You associate that, you know, with something that's unpleasant, maybe, if it's in the middle of the night. Okay. All right, so that's the limbic system. Now the last part we're going to look at is going to be the brain stem and the cerebellum. The brain stem and the cerebellum. Take home for the brain stem is it's involved with a lot of uh, operations of our body that are necessary for life. So what are some really important things that keep us alive? That if they stop, we die. What's that? Breathing. Breathing, yeah. So respiratory system, what's another one? Blood flow, what's the major pump for blood flow? Heart, yes. So respiratory system and heart, two major ones whose regulation happens here in the brainstem. Not the only thing that goes on, but those are the two major ones. The structures that are part of the brainstem, I'll get your question in just a second. The superior most part is the midbrain. Then we have this bulging section, which is called the pons, and then just below that we have something called the medulla oblongata. So here, this is going to be the midbrain up here, and then you see this bulging part, that's the pons. Just below that is going to be the medulla oblongata. All right, okay. Sorry, go ahead. That, I think it's pretty, I think um, oxygen, not terribly sure on that, but the neuronal structures are very metabolically active, so depriving them of oxygen or a glucose source causes uh, a lot of brain damage. I know uh, if you disrupt brain flow so that you disrupt nutrients to the brain, I think uh, that happens within 10 minutes. Yeah, so it turns out that um, even though the brain's only roughly 2% of our body, you know, weight, it does, it gets about 20% of our energy. So it's, I, I don't, I, it's not very long. It's not very long. It doesn't take long at all. Okay, so the midbrain has a lot of reflex centers. One of the areas is the substantia nigra, which produces the dopamine that projects the nuclei that smooths out movements, right? And so here, this is the area affected in people that have Parkinson's disease. We also have some reflex centers in here for visual and auditory reflexes, you know, uh, here in the midbrain. And remember, the midbrain isn't middle of the brain. <laughs> It's part of the brain stem. It's actually this part here. Okay. All right. So here, if we look at Parkinson's disease, some of the products uh, in the synthesis of dopamine are kind of black. They turn out black when you look at them. And so that's why this area is called the substantia nigra. You can see that it's lost in someone with Parkinson's disease. Right? And so individuals that have problems, all right, or Parkinson's disease, have problems with having smooth movement. Okay? All right. All right. So they're going to have tremors, having difficulty in being able to, say, uh, easily put a coin into a slot. So skilled motor movement. All right? And unfortunately, I don't have time, but I encourage you guys to take a look at this video. So this is deep brain stimulation. So they actually put electrodes in this individual's brain who has Parkinson's. And it's pretty amazing. His tremors pretty much go away when they get the right frequency of brain stimulation. So I encourage you guys to look at that video. All right. Um, all right. And so that's this video here. So deep brain stimulation. Okay. So other treatments are pharmacological, where they put in 
say, L-dopa, which gets converted into dopamine. So remember, it's a loss of dopamine, so they're trying to supplement the little bit of dopamine that's there, right? Okay. So this is going to, you know, uh, talking about what you guys said. Other structures of the brainstem, the pons is involved with breathing rate and depth. And it's there to relay information between uh, other parts of the brain and the cerebellum. So if you take a look at it, it's actually on the same level as a cerebellum, right? So it's going to be involved with routing things between the cerebellum and the rest of the brain. Okay? All right? So that's what we're talking about here. So just like with the pons, the medulla oblongata is also involved with respiratory, but also regulating heart rate. So individuals that have problems in the brain stem, what are, the, what are they going to look like? What are they going to have problems with? <laughs> yes, respiratory issues, cardiovascular, and also they may have issues with you know, certain responses, right? Visceral reflexes, okay? All right. So be sure to be able to ID the structures and just know the take home, all right? And the last one was just taking a look at the cerebellum, which is involved with coordination of movement. So postural reflexes is a major take home for the cerebellum, okay? All right? Um, and so that is going to need, you're going to need balance and equilibrium for that. So that's going to be a major issue, right? So go through these structures and areas, know what the major take home is for each one, and that's going to help you understand what's going to, what that is going to look like for the individual if that area is damaged, all right? Okay.